From the depths of hell did we hear their screams, rising above the profane icons and blasphemous symbols, blood-curdling howls echoing in the night. It was the time of the beastmen, plunging towards a literal heart of darkness, of wicked ways and tortured runes. The silence and the fury is here, and Torox the Brass Bull leads his bright herds in the furriest crusade you will ever clap eyes on. Hello everyone, welcome to Embargo Day. I'm your host, Indy Pride from Milk and Cookies Total War, and in this video, we're going to be highlighting every new addition to the Beastmen roster. Their stats, their animations, their abilities, and a healthy dose of cinematic flair as we break down how best to use each of these new toys on the battlefields of Total War Warhammer 2. It has been a long time coming, but the Cloven Ones are no longer a lose condition. They are no longer a meme. Their roster is impressive as hell, and the Golden Phallus in the background does a pretty damn good job of representing my excitement over this update. Let's jump right in, and to get things kicked off is Torox the Brass Bull himself, unleashing carnage in ways never before seen. He is a high value hunter, a legendary lore designed from the ground up to chase after heavily armored monsters and mollywop them into Age of Sigmar. All those dinosaurs and tier 5 freaks that were giving the beastmen fits? Well, Torox represents the beginning of the end of that 5 year saga. His job is to seek out the most dangerous units on the enemy side of the battlefield and use his impressive combination of speed, armor piercing, and combat steroids to isolate and destroy them quickly, all while outtaking incoming damage with huge ward saves and one of the highest armor values in the game. Fully kitted out, he costs 2300 gold, so certainly an expensive pick, but you do get what you pay for. 130 armor, speed equivalent to heavy cav, flaming attacks, and a very generous AP weapon split. But the stats you see here are not reflective of his dueling prowess, because he gets plus 10 melee attack from Slaughterer's Call, and plus 5 melee attack from Blood Greed passively while fighting. As long as he's in melee, he has those buffs. So he essentially has 70 melee attack base, and that will go even higher when you can take into consideration his items. But offensive potential isn't his only strong suit. His brass body ability turns him into an impenetrable juggernaut for 41 seconds, granting a 40% ward save that cannot be bypassed by magical damage and plus 24 melee defense as well. As with most of his abilities, it will only recharge in melee, and you will almost never get it off more than twice in a single battle, at least not in multiplayer. Blood Beast is his get out of jail free card if he gets surrounded and pinned down by infantry, a massive explosion that knocks back enemies in a similar manner to Verminous Valor for Queek or other Skaven Lords, only it's a literal torrent of steam built up inside his body that he releases in a massive explosion. But in a rare design approach, it also functions as a single entity nuke, dealing burst damage to nearby armored monsters and lowering their leadership as well. Finally, his rune tortured axes stack yet another plus 10 melee attack and weapon damage buff on top of everything else, but will go on cooldown for 90 seconds when he disengages. So you're encouraged to find an awesome fight for him using that 64 speed. He can pick and choose his engagements quite well, then just let him sit there ripping and tearing until it's done. His rolling attacks are kind of a blessing and a curse. He has some great animations that can save your ass, and he also has some that can kind of get you stuck back in to some kind of dangerous problems as well. Interesting thing to note, the weak spot on his neck that ultimately gets him killed by Marcus Wolfhart in the lore is very visible in-game, but plays no part in his narrative nor in his in-game stats whatsoever. But Achilles' heel or not, he is absolutely going to be a viable and competitive pick in Warhammer 2's current meta. His dueling and monster killing potential is invaluable to the Beastmen. This dude hits like a goddamn Mack truck. Next up, we have my personal favorite unit from the entire DLC, and the monster the Cloven Ones most needed to compete in campaign and multiplayer. He's here. The almighty Gorgon is stampeding into town, and is already set to become one of the premier anti-large doomstackers in Mortal Empires. He costs a whopping 2,000 Warhammer bucks, so it does not come cheap, but for that price, you have a four-armed monstrosity with an amazing animation set that can beat the brakes off a Carnosaur in melee with its 30 bonus first large. 87 melee attack against large dinosaurs, 520 weapon strength, great maneuverability for a monster this size, and regen in melee with strength from flesh. The Blood Brute Behemoth Regiment of Renown is even scarier. It's a Gorgon blessed with a Blood God and is predictably quite proficient at making it rain crimson. Costs 550 more gold, so 2550 overall, 
but has 22 more melee attack than the standard Gorgon, 9 more melee defense, 50 more weapon strength, and almost 100 leadership, which functionally makes him unbreakable. He can route, but realistically, you've already lost the battle if that's happening. Most importantly, he has scaling damage, which means the more HP an enemy Stegodon or dinosaur or monster has lost, the more damage this Gorgon will do. Requires some more testing on my front, but I think the only monster in the game that has a chance to beat him in a 1v1 fight is the Shredder of Lustria Dreadsaurian, which is crazy. That thing costs 3,700 gold. Its major weakness, of course, is that huge hitbox and low armor. So Gorgons can be countered effectively by some of the cheapest archers in the game. Because as we know, focus fire from a few bows is incredibly oppressive for single entities and has been since launch. But at least this dude has 64 speed. He's not like a giant where he'll just get shot to death immediately. He can run away. You will want to leave Gorgons at home when going up against factions like the High Elves and Wood Elves. 64 speed is solid mobility, but they don't have enough gas to catch hit and run races unless you've got like a full stack of them on the prowl. And don't worry too much about that regen in melee. It's nice to have. You will occasionally notice it, but it's not a complete game changer. And you definitely do not want to try to outheal javelin or arrow fire coming your way, which is a trap some newer players might fall into. If you're being shot, just because you have regen, it doesn't matter. You need to run. It does not have enough armor to survive for long, even with its massive HP pool. That's why you use that 64 speed to disengage when needed and look for another opportunity to plunge back in. But yeah, the way you use them is simple. Let them hunt monsters and keep them away from skirmish fire. If you do that, they will put in work for you. They will carve apart carnosaurs. They will slice and dice stegodons. They will disembowel dinosaurs. And they are the beastmen's final answer to the unit archetype that would consistently spell their doom in previous patches. Drop dead, gorgeous monster. Fantastic animations to boot. Highlight of the DLC for me. But of course, we can't talk Silence and Fury without discussing Charlemagne the God, the creature that would have taken the entire art budget for Attila's Age of Charlemagne DLC to produce. Many years later, we finally have it, and it is as hideously beautiful as we could have possibly expected. 1700 gold, this is a non-flying, poison-spewing infantry blender with a mortis effect, and is best used against low leadership factions like the Skaven, and ironically, the Beastmen. You can throw vampire counts and some others in there as well. If you think your opponent is going to swarm the field in bodies, lots of skinks, lots of clan rats, lots of skeletons and zombies, maybe even dwarf warriors, Jabber Slife is the way to go. You kind of feel bad for it because it so desperately wants to fly with those scraggy ass wings, but somehow it just can't quite manage. Which doesn't hurt it too bad because it still has 65 speed. Good leadership, middling stats, but 25 bonus versus infantry and 450 weapon strength means it hits hard even before we get to the abilities, and the special effects are what makes this beast a blubber tick. Aura of Madness constantly drains health from all enemies in a 40 meter radius once their leadership drops below 50%, which means it has crazy damage potential if you are able to manipulate enemy morale. If you are dropping their leadership, this thing's mortis effect kicks in and it will start murdering everything. The Regiment of Renown version, the Vorgbergland Broodmother, has 9 more leadership, attack, and defense as a result of those chevrons, but comes with armor sundering base, and a searing bile blood that pierces and sunders armor more effectively. So what we have here is quite literally a fast mortis engine that is designed to break enemy infantry quickly and punish them when they rout. It is murderous against low leadership factions if it can be kept alive, and it's best paired with leadership debuffs like Doom and Darkness, to stack those penalties alongside terror, get units running, and then get that mortis effect activated and spreading throughout the enemy army. Remember, Nurglefowl's stink got nerfed in campaign down to minus four leadership in this patch, but if you're stacking that up with something like Something Wicked This Way Comes and all of Malagor's morale debuffs, perhaps running Jabber Slice alongside that, you're draining massive amounts of HP in an AoE with a unit that already has solid stats, good mobility, obscene mass. I mean, it can push through anything, and with its attack animations, which carry it all the way through enemy armies, it will go on the other side and escape from dangerous situations all the time. And then it has poison on top of that, lots of AP, armor sundering, and wave clear with the bile blood. Against many of the factions it would perform well against, it is quite vulnerable to being bursted down by artillery and gunfire. But for savvy players, 
who can get them into melee unscathed and pressure an opponent's back line with their other tools. If the Jabber is given time to sit there and feast in the middle of an enemy army, it can single-handedly win you games. It is a pretty crazy unit. A lot of fun to use. In the hero slot, we have the Wargore Chieftain, and in almost every circumstance, you will want to run him on a chariot. In terms of cost efficiency, the new Tuskor Chariot is your best option 9 times out of 10, so that's what we're going to highlight here. With his two abilities and a Tuskor mount, he costs roughly 1200 gold, and for that price, you get a beastly, if somewhat fragile, single entity chariot that I think will become a staple of the Brayherds in multiplayer. Sure, the Razor Gore Chariot gives him more HP and slightly better stats, but Tuskors are significantly cheaper and are super efficient for busting through enemy battle lines and blending foot troops. With a bonus for infantry of 20 and 80 plus charge bonus, that shouldn't really come as a surprise. His Will of the Dark Gods passive gives all friendlies in a 40 meter radius leadership and melee defense, but really you're taking him for his ability to kill and kill quickly. And with Deadly Onslaught skyrocketing his charge up past 130, only a full-on Cavs round or monster unit is going to stop his momentum on the way in. There will be, I think, a lot of army compositions with one or two Tuskor riding Wargors alongside Malagor the Dark Omen or the new Great Bray Shaman. And I think they are going to be incredibly annoying to deal with. Cycle charge infantry all day long, keep them moving, and they will rack up eye-watering amounts of kills. Coming in at 750 gold, everything I just said about Wargors on Tuskors holds true here for regular Tuskor chariots as well. An incredibly cheap, cost-efficient chariot with surprisingly good speed, charge bonus, killing power, and vanguard deployment. Which means you vanguard with your Wargors, with Kazrak, with the rest of your army if you're really feeling cheeky, and immediately you can just overload an enemy flank right at the start of a match, which can be crazy fun. I think they will almost entirely replace Razor Gore Chariots in multiplayer. They do all the same things at a less expensive price point, and cost efficiency is so often the name of the game. Not an incredibly exciting addition, but a very solid choice nonetheless. Now I will say, staying on top of your micro with them might be quite challenging, especially for newer players, so I recommend operating them in control groups of maybe only two or three, bouncing them from unit to unit without having to individually control each model. Once you get up to like four or five chariots in an army, even really good players are going to have some challenges controlling that without their brains melting. So keep it stupid simple. Keep them together and you should quite enjoy the return on investment these bacon boys afford. Let's be honest, these little piggies are absolutely freaking adorable. Moving on to the last lord choice, we have Great Bray Shamans, which finally give the beastmen a caster lord not named Malagor. They come in four different flavors, beasts, wild, death, and shadows, can be mounted on Tuskors or Razor Gores, just what it says on the tin. The most important benefit of their inclusion is simply how it opens up your options when tackling army composition. Having a cheap Caster Lord means you can go double Wargore or double Gorble in that hero slot and simply just afford more support and a wider army in general. His unique skill is Distorted Reality, a constant hex that lowers melee attack and speed in a 40 meter radius around him. It's not a game changing ability at all, but will give you your fast movers even more of a mobility advantage and helps him disengage if he's about to get caught himself. And finally, we have the Grog Hooves of Wolf's Run, a diseased, decaying centigore unit blessed by Nurgle, covered in pox and open sores, wielding poison throwing axes and a drunken bravado passive that gives them regen until they waver or rout. That will not be an incredibly useful ability, above and beyond the, how the normal rowdy ability works anyway, simply because of how fragile centigore models are. If they're taking damage, they're quickly losing models anyway, and the regen won't bring them back, but they are obviously a hyper-mobile force, so in those situations where horse archers or skirmishers are maybe trying to plunk away at them a bit, it will certainly give them a little bit more extra survivability. Poison throwing axes, on the other hand, are pretty interesting. Literally nothing in the game can catch them while poisoned, so if they land a shot, they'll be free to plunk away at high-value units without really any fear of reprisal besides being shot themselves. Still though, while centigore throwing axes are great, they're great because you can swarm the field with them and get a bunch of AP projectiles going towards high value monsters. And so it's more about numbers with them, not about fielding any one particular elite unit. I don't think spending all that extra gold for poison and a bit of regen is going to be worth it here, especially when you can almost afford another Ungor unit for that price. Looking at them on paper, they don't really impress me and I'm not sure they'll see much play. 
That is every new unit in the Silence and the Fury for the Beastmen side of the conflict. It's an army rush that looks great now. I love the units. I love the models. I love the stats. They're going to be a much better faction, and I am super excited to see what they can do on the battlefields of Total War Warhammer 2. Hope you guys enjoyed the spotlight of all of these new toys, and I'll see you all in the next video. Any pride, signing out for now. Have a good one, guys.